How are we doing? We all right? Yeah? Can I be really honest? Church, I love you very much. I think you're very beautiful people. But I see a lot of tired faces today. Is that a fair... Is that a fair statement to me? Can anyone relate to that? I feel like there's quite a few tired parents in the room. I'm not looking at anyone in particular. I'm just generally making that statement. But isn't God good? Isn't he good? Wasn't there just that sense? I don't know if you can relate to this, of his peace during worship there. I just felt a real sense of his peace, that real desire that it doesn't matter what we're going through. It doesn't matter what we're going to. He wants to meet with us. And he wants to give us his peace that transcends understanding. And it's beautiful. And he's so good. He's so faithful to us. You know, there was, um, there was a group of young men, some of them quite likely were, were teenagers and, and their life was about to change in a really significant way. They didn't quite understand how, but it was, it was about to really shift because they'd been following this man. His name was Jesus and, and he'd been doing absolutely amazing things and they're, they're starting to realise maybe he is who he says he is. Maybe he is the king of kings. <laughs> Maybe he is the son of God. Maybe he is the one who's going to come and save all of us. He's going he's to save us. He's going to rescue us. He's going to come back for his people. I think it might be him, but his language is really confusing. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. It's not really what, what we were expecting him to be saying because he's not talking about conquering the current rulers through military might. Instead, all of his language, it points to this kingdom that's coming, but it's not here yet, but it's come through him. And for, for that to happen, he's going to have to leave them. What? The, the one who's been doing all the miracles, the one who's been teaching them with such a love and with such a joy, the one who's been showing himself to be the son of God is going to have to go. He's going to have to leave them, but, but that'll be for, for their good. He, he promises that'll be good. And as a result of him going, one day, not yet, but one day, they're going to be able to go with him. They're going to go to the place that he is going and it's going to be amazing for them. And perhaps understandably so, the disciples are thoroughly confused. They're, they're struggling to get their heads around, as I'm sure many of us would have, what's being said to them. They can't quite see what's happening yet. They don't really get what's going on. How are these things you're saying going to be to our benefit? How are these, how are these promises going to be for our goods? But Jesus knows this and he, he sees their hearts, he sees what they're thinking and he, he speaks up, he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. We're in John 14, by the way, in case you want to fact check me, we're not staying there, but uh, John 14, he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and I will take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. And then he says, you know the way to the place where I am going. And the poor disciples, this confuses them even more. They're like, no, you don't seem to understand Jesus. That's the whole point. We don't know the way. We don't know where you're going. We don't know anything. We don't know what's coming around the corner. We don't know what's happening next. I definitely don't know what I'm meant to be doing right now. This is all very confusing. And, and Thomas pipes up. He says, Lord, we don't know where you were going. So how can we know the way? And Jesus answers with some of the most beautiful, most significant words that have ever been spoken. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. And the, the weight of these words, the, the beauty of these words were perhaps still lost on the disciples at the time. It wouldn't be until the coming days and the coming weeks and the coming months that they would realise just how beautiful of a thing that it was that Jesus was promising to them. But today, for us, we are gathered here as people who know Jesus' promise for us. We are gathered here as people who don't need to try and don't need to try and figure it out. We don't need to try and understand what it means. He's, he's shown us. He's displayed it. We know that salvation and freedom from our sin, a life lived in fullness, and then an eventual eternity spent with the one who knitted us together in our mother's womb, who knows us more intimately and more um, closely than anyone we could possibly ask or imagine. And that life is found through Jesus Christ, crucified and resurrected again who then one day will come back and when he comes back as we've sung already this morning every knee will bow and every tribe and tongue will confess that he and he alone is the king of kings and the lord of lords and as a result we are here this morning as a forward-facing people we're a forward-facing people. That word hope has come out a few times already this morning. I'm really glad it has because we are a forward-facing people. We are those with our gaze fixed on what is to come. We know what's coming. We've been told. <laughs> 
And you know, our live in hope, it's, it's rooted in an event that's already taken place when Jesus died and was raised back to life again. And we are reminded of it constantly in the present, even this morning, his presence amongst us, his goodness to us, him healing hearts, setting people free. We see him doing this all the time, but ultimately our hope is in what is to come. We have the joy of fixing our gaze ahead. We're instructed in Hebrews to be those who run the race with perseverance and who hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. Why? Because the one who made the promise is good. Because the one who made the promise of hope is good. He's the king, he's worth trusting, he's worth listening to, he's worth holding fast to. Like we heard from Chris this morning, he's the mountain, he's the rock. He's not going anywhere. When he says something, it's happened, it's done. It's, it's written, it will take place. And you know, sometimes we, we may feel as the disciples felt, um, we may feel like, oh, if I'm really honest, don't quite understand what's going on. I definitely can't see what's around the corner and I really don't know what I am meant to be doing. But ultimately, we can be those of a sure and a certain hope about what is to come. We're a forward-facing people. We know the one who we are following. We have a destination, we have a purpose, we are not without aim. But unfortunately, pretty much the only other guarantee alongside of that is that on our way to the future hope, there are things that are desperately trying to derail us. The flip side of the coin, really, there are things that are desperately trying to take our gaze off of Jesus. There are things that are desperately trying to tempt us, to distract us, to pressurize us into compromising on what we believe so that as a result, actually, we would fall into these traps and we would live lives that are less than what Jesus wants them to be. Not in like a marks out of 10 way, not in like a wagging my finger, you didn't do it right way, but in a, guys, I have so much more for you than this way. There's so many things trying to pull our attention, so many tr things trying to uh, pull our gaze. And so this morning, we're, we're going to be looking at what, what do we do when we face those situations? What do we do when we face those circumstances that have the potential to cause us to compromise? Um, to compromise on the certain hope to which we hold fast. And um, I, I've kind of taken the scenic route to arrive at the passage today. Some of you are looking at me like, yeah, you definitely have. Um, but I, Joe, I do that unapologetically because the, the older I get, the more I realise as an individual, I wonder if you can relate to this, I'm just so zoomed in on things. Like so zoomed in, like I get so caught up in the nitty gritty or something like, you know, Sarah and I will be doing a bit of wedding planning and, and I'll decide that oh, this is the only way that something can happen. That this is the only, the only option. And it's not until you wake up the next day that you go, what, who cares? Like it can happen a hundred other ways. We get really fixated on things. We get really zoomed in on things. And I think when we're talking about compromise, there's a potential to feel really condemned this morning. There's a potential to come to that thinking of all the times we've compromised, <laughs> thinking of all the times we've got it wrong, thinking of all the times we've messed up. But I think the only antidote to that is remembering just how outrageous God's love is for us. It's remembering to place ourselves appropriately in his big story. It's not about condemnation this morning. It's about reminding ourselves, reconvicting ourselves of how outrageously great his love is for us. And as a result, we would see the life that he wants for us as appealing, we would see it as the thing that we want to do. It's not about feeling bad about what we have or what we haven't done. It's about being re-encouraged to go for what he has for us with all that we've got. So that's why I've kind of unapologetically spent a bit of time there this morning. But we are going to jump into Exodus. We're in Exodus 1, verses 8 to 21. Um, and I hope, I hope that as we read this this morning, we're just encouraged to draw closer to him. We're just encouraged to draw closer to the one who wants to draw impossibly close to us. So Exodus 1. Verses 8 to 21, it says this. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, they'll join our enemies. They'll fight against us, and they'll leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. And they built Pithom and Ramesses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more, uh, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and they worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. And in all of their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. Now the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose name was Shifra and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, anyone looked up what a delivery stool is, by the way? 
I'll leave that for you to do at home. Um, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, well, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and they give birth before the midwives arrive. What an answer. So God was kind to the midwives and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. I just, want to, um, I just want to state this really clearly. I was going to try and sort of weave this through the subtext of what we're talking about this morning, but I'm just going to say it instead. I think that's the easier way. We are, we are biblically commanded to obey human authority. That is a biblical command. That is something that we are absolutely meant to do. But when those commands go against what we know is God's will, then God's authority and his commands always come before those of human beings. Let me just state that really explicitly. Let there be no minced words. Let no one misunderstand what I'm saying there. If God says something and someone else says something else, we do the God thing. That's the, that's the, the flow chart. That's our hierarchy this morning. His commands, they must come first. And actually as a result, that means that sometimes the commands of human authority must be ignored or sometimes they must be actively worked against. And you know, I think it's worth, it's worth noting that the, really, the reason that believers are often placed in situation of compromise is it's because of the selfishness of man. So the Israelites here, they're, they're seen as a threat to the way the Egyptians are doing life. They're seen as a threat to the power of the Pharaoh. They're going to get too big. They're going to come and take us over or even worse, they'll join with our enemies, fight against us and then leave the country. We can't allow that to happen. We must oppress them. And you know, the same was said about Jesus in the Gospels. It was really clear that he was a threat. He was a threat to greed. He was a threat to a lot of the strongholds. He was a threat to the power of people who got quite comfy in their situations. And as a result, people did not like what he was doing. And even before his crucifixion, Jesus is repeatedly put in situations where he will have been tempted to compromise on what he believed for an easier time. If I don't say that thing, they won't attack me. You know, that's the stakes that we're dealing with. It's not like insignificant things. And the same continues to be the case for the early church throughout Acts. And the same is the case for us today. It's, it's healthy to have an awareness of how the things that we are involved in due to our faith often go directly against the strongholds of this world. It's healthy to be aware of that. Not so that we would run away, not so that we would flee when the opposition arises, but that we would be encouraged that actually when we face difficulty, when we face opposition and we are in God's will, that is to be expected. It is to be expected. Slightly off topic, but for me, debt advice came to mind this morning. That is against one of the strongholds of this world. Keeping people in crippling debt is a stronghold of this world. And what Debs is doing there is against that. We should expect opposition. We should pray for her. We really, really should. I'm reminded of Pastor Slavic who... Um, for a season of time was working with um, women who were in, um, they were forced to be prostitutes basically and he was, he was saving them, he was getting them to safe places and uh, he has a knock on the door and it's the mafia with a gun pointing to his head because what he was doing was against the stronghold of this world. It's, it's real, there's a real enemy, there's a real opposition. You know, Jesus confirms this himself. He says in Matthew 10, 6, 16, sorry, behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So, be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. He's saying, be aware. Be aware that living the life that I am calling you to live is actually going to lead to opposition in a whole various different type of forms. It doesn't mean that you're on the wrong path just because there's difficulty. You might be. It's not a guaranteed sign. Just because you have a hard time doesn't mean you're doing the right thing. But the difficulty doesn't mean that we're definitely in the wrong path. We can expect this. We can expect this opposition. So, so what do we do? What do we do when we, when we face these situations where compromise is actually an appealing option? If I compromise in what I believe here, I will have an easier time. And as a result, that's an appealing option. What, what do we do? You know, you may, you may feel that the example given here in Exodus is almost too extreme, maybe too old to apply to modern day, but we only need to go back less than 100 years when a man called Adolf Hitler rose to power in Nazi Germany and all of a sudden, Christians, Bible-believing, Jesus-following Christians all over the country were placed in a situation, are we going to compromise on what we believe in or are we going to risk our lives? Are we going to ignore God's command to love my neighbour as myself? 
Are we going to ignore God's commands to value human life above all else? Am I going to spurn the Jewish people? Am I going to allow them to be taken, to be put in these horrible places? Or are we going to make a stand? Are we going to do something about it? And praise God for the hundreds and I want to say thousands, I don't know that for a fact, but the many Christians who stood against, actively opposed the Nazi regime and actually got Jewish people to places of safety who were heavily involved in not allowing this to take place at great risk to their own life. Many of them were sent to concentration camps. Many of them were executed. But ultimately, they were people who understood the point of the story that we're reading today. We cannot compromise on what we believe in Christ. We can't do it. It's not one of the options. And even, even Nazi Germany, it's too old of an example because we are full well aware that it, it, all over the world and people have come in the room, people have come from places where being a Christian is not a safe thing to do. There is a human authority that is established there that says if you live out your faith, there will be consequences, there will be punishments, there will be things that happen to you if you profess what you believe to be true. We know that it's all over the world. Today, as we are here in freedom on a Sunday morning, both the name freedom, but literal freedom, we're allowed to do this this morning. There are people all over the world who are really not allowed to do it. Or well, they risk compromising, uh, not in terms of the theme that we're talking about, sorry. They, they, risk, they risk their own safety or they risk their family's safety as a result. Um, and you know, we believe that God, he's a God of love. He's a God of protection, that he often provides a way out for people who are in those situations. And some people actually, he, he really inspires by his Holy Spirit. He convicts them to stay. He convicts them to stay and to make a stand. And many people face death as a result of what they believe. But whatever the specifics of the situation may be, ultimately we need to be people who understand that we do not compromise on what we believe in Christ. That's what the story's trying to teach us. And it seems fairly trivial to mention that, um, you know, the circumstances that we face in Britain as Christians compared to a lot of the things we've talked about already, it's quite minor. It's not often that you'll be placed in a life-threatening situation in this country because of your faith. I won't say never, but it's not often at all. Um, But it is still appropriate to acknowledge that actually in this country, in Britain, the biblical values that we are given as followers of Jesus are actively under attack. They are actively under attack. And that is not a societal problem that is likely to get better. I think it's going to get worse. We only need to look at some of our neighbours in Scotland and elsewhere and see the progression of things and how things are happening. It's not going to get easier as the years go by. I don't believe that to be the case. And some of us will already be in situations or some of us are likely to face situations in the future where we will have a choice. We will have a temptation to compromise in what we believe. That will be one of the options that faces us. And we need to remember our ultimate call that we are not those who compromise in what we believe in Christ. Why? Because he's in charge. He is the ultimate authority. He has the first and the final say on what is wrong. When we come across a situation that conflicts with what we know of his will and we have that sense of unease, can you relate to that? Have you ever had that sense of, oh, this situation just makes me really uncomfortable? The reason that we have that sense is because of him in the first place. We haven't come to that conclusion for ourselves. We believe that all good things come from Christ Jesus, that by his Holy Spirit, he convicts us, he shows us what is right, he shows us what is wrong. And as a result, we find that we we're in these situations, we're really, really uncomfortable. All good things come from him and yet we can still find it exceptionally difficult to do the right thing. Is that a fair comment? We can find it really hard to do the right thing. So how can that be? How can I cognitively know that that prompting, that sense of unease is from God, it's from his presence with me, his spirit with me, and yet still find it so difficult to act upon? That's a problem. That's, 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 that's going to be an issue for us, isn't it? If we're, if we're facing these situations, then that's going to be a problem. I think, thankfully, we, we find the solution in verse 17, where it really simply says, the midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king had told them, but let the boys live. They feared God. It's, it's a funny word, fear. I think it, it carries quite a lot of negative connotations in the way that we tend to use it. I'd love to be very clever and tell you, oh, it's only this translation that says fear. All the other ones say something else. They don't. They all say fear. Fear is the intended and deliberate word. It's not a mistake. It's not a, mis- a mistranslation. The midwives feared God. And let's just be real for a moment. Fear is the appropriate response to a being that made absolutely everything to whom our default state is that of an enemy. 
the one who knows the sinful innermost depths of our hearts and in a moment's notice could wipe us off for the face of the planet and it would be right because he did it because he's the one who decides what is right and wrong. It wouldn't be the wrong thing to do if he did that. God did it, so it's right. It's just. Fear is an appropriate response to that, to that being. It's not irrational to fear God, but what is made exceptionally clear in the Bible exceptionally clear possibly possibly more so than how powerful he is possibly more so than how worthy of fear and awe he is possibly more so than just how big he is what is made exceptionally clear is that God wants to draw close to us that's what he wants to do he wants to draw desperately close to us and he doesn't need to make himself less worthy of our fear he doesn't need to make himself less worthy of our awe or our reverence because instead he is so extravagant in his love for us He's so extravagant in his love for us. And as a result, we need not fear him, at least not in the way that the the negative side of the word would hold for us today. When we think of fear, we probably think, oh, spiders or whatever it is for you. That's That's not what we're talking about today. It's this healthy awareness of how big, powerful, worthy, reverent our God is. He's incredible. Those words of C.S. Lewis come to mind for anyone who's um, seen or read the, the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. It's a, it's a, a fictional portraying of the gospel story. It's like for, made, you know, made with uh, fictional characters and Jesus is represented by a lion called Aslan and he dies and he comes back to life again. And the little girl sees him come back to life and she says to one of the other characters, is he, is he quite safe? And the other character replies, safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king. That's the sort of fear we're talking about, you know? Um, And this is especially true for us today because we know the price that God was willing to pay for us. We now live in that expression of love called Jesus Christ. That's our status. We are those who've been bought, redeemed by him, restored, as we heard this morning. And I I believe it's this type of fear, it's this appropriate awe and reverence for just how in charge God really is, combined with his desire to draw desperately close to us, that we find our hearts being transformed in ways that make us able to face these situations, make us able to face these temptations, make us able to respond to these times where we could compromise in a way that pleases him instead. It's a healthy fear, I know how big you are, but Lord, you're so good (laughs) and you've drawn so close to me. This is um, it's a personal observation, so it would be, I'm just going to say this, it'd be helpful if you nodded, if you can relate to this, because if it's only me, I might just have to make something else up on the fly. But often when I, when I approach a situation of temptation or a situation where I could compromise, I could do something that really I, I know isn't the right thing to do, my internal dialogue, I use modal verbs, Andy, um, I use modal verbs like, I shouldn't, you relate to that? Or I won't. They tend to be the words that come to my mind. Oh, I shouldn't do that, or I won't do that. And please let me be really, really clear. That's a good thing to do. It's a good thing to do something because we know we shouldn't. It's a good thing to choose not to do something. James chapter four says to us, resist the enemy and he will flee from you. That is a really good thing. There are many things in our lives that will respond, um, require us, sorry, to respond with, no, I shouldn't do that. No, I won't do that. I'm gonna choose what Jesus tells me to do instead. That is a really good thing to do. But... I don't think that quite captures what's going on for these midwives. And now I've not read this in a commentary. I might be totally wrong. This is just my own prayer and reading. So come up and challenge me at the end. If you think I've got this totally wrong, I'm absolutely fine with that. But I don't think it's summed up by I shouldn't. And I don't think it's summed up by I won't. You know, I read of these, of these women and they're in a situation, it's, it's, it'd be unfair to call it a life and death situation. It's multiple lives and multiple deaths. The stakes are, are infinitely large. It's a really dire situation. And actually for them to not obey, for them to go against the Pharaoh's orders, it's not even that they might just face like a simple clean execution. He is in ultimate power over them. He can place them in a position of prolonged torture for the rest of their lives with no rights and no worth and no one could do anything about it. They are fully under his power. We need to understand the stakes that we are in here. And yet, their fear in God causes them to act justly and not compromise on what they believe. I don't think their their heart response is appropriately summed up by I shouldn't do that or I won't do that. Rather, I think this is one of those, those situations where the people of God know him, they fear him, they've allowed him to draw close to them. They've allowed him to start to transform their hearts. They've allowed him into the depths 
into the darkest bits, into those bits that really need his light shining on them so that when they approach this situation, they understand the authority that they are under and they don't respond with, I shouldn't. They don't respond with, I won't. They respond with, I can't. I can't. I cannot partake in this evil. That is not something that I can do. I am far too aware of my father's will for this situation. He has so graciously and so mercifully taken that dark part of my heart and transformed it for his glory that as a result, I cannot compromise in this. I am under an authority that will not allow me to do this. I cannot. I think that's a totally different heart response. A totally different heart response. Not I shouldn't, not I won't but I can't and uh, you know I, I don't know about you guys but I want more of my heart response to be I can't in those situations I want more of my heart response when I come across temptation again I'm not belittling I won't I'm not belittling I shouldn't they're good things that's obedience but I just want my response to be I can't I know the authority that I'm under some of you know I came from a background of fairly prolonged drug addiction and and when I got saved man Jesus nailed me on the I can't of getting high. Like within 24 hours, it's the closest I've come to audibly hearing the voice of God. I knew if I want to spend time in his words, if I want to spend time getting to know him and getting to know who he is, I cannot do this. It didn't matter whether I wanted to or not. I did. I still wanted to take drugs. I was still addicted to them. It was something that I wanted to do, but my heart's response was I cannot. I can't do that. It's not something that I can do. But just to be really honest with you, there's so many things that I still reply I shouldn't. <laughs> and there's so many areas that I have to choose. I won't do that. And like I say, it's good. It is good. But I just believe this morning, there's more on offer when we talk about freedom in Christ Jesus. There will always be things that need I won't. There will always be things that need I shouldn't. But just this morning, I think God wants to sow some seeds if I can't in our hearts. And we know, you know, there's no condemnation in being his beautiful work in progress. I'm not here to shame anyone who's thinking, oh, I really, I really have to plumb up the strength to, to resist temptation. That's not what I'm talking about. But I just think there's something fresh for some of us today. I want our desire to be that we are those who are fully, wholeheartedly submitted to him. And as we spend more time with him, as we allow who he is to really settle in our hearts, as we slowly but surely give him more and more and more of who we are, I want to see those deep, dark, unreached areas of my heart be touched by the light of his glory. And I want to witness as they are transformed before my very eyes. I want to see them conform into his will. That's the promise of his word, that the depths of my soul would begin to obey the one who is in ultimate authority. I want more and more to arrive at situations of temptation, situations where I could compromise and not really tense up and struggle to just mutter out, I won't or I shouldn't. I want my heart response to say, I cannot I can't do it because I know the God who loves me. I know the God who died for me. I know the God who raised back to life again and he's dealt with that bit in my heart. It says in Ephesians, everything that is illuminated by the light shall itself become light. That the light shines in the darkness and nothing can overcome it. That's what I'm talking about this morning. I, really, I just really strongly feel that's something God wants to do for some people today. It may be something that you've repeatedly struggled with. It may be something you don't even know is coming around the corner. But I think he just really wants to sow some seeds of I cannot in our hearts this morning. I don't need to be prophetic to say that. It's in his word. He wants to meet with us. He wants to transform us. And you're a, groom, a room full of people who need transforming by God, just like I do. You don't have to feel some deep sense of prophetic anointing to say, Lord, I want that this morning. We can just want it. And he says, okay, it's yours. It's a free gift. Um, I actually feel this is a rogue one. I might be totally wrong. I feel there's someone here who... Um, you are in a position in your occupation that means that you have some control over finances. Um, and someone has asked you to do something with their finances. It's not as clear cut as stealing. It's a little bit more complicated than that. But ultimately, it's not using them in the way that you're meant to use them. I might be totally wrong. I just feel like there's someone in the room that that applies to. And maybe you thought it was just a one-time thing and it hasn't been a one-time thing. It's been repeated. And understandably, there's fear around that. There's fear of turning back on that. There's fear of saying, I shouldn't do this. I won't do this. I really think God wants to give you and I can't. 
this morning. It's not a shame. It's not a condemnation thing. It's something that he wants to set you free from. So if that applies to anyone in the room, why don't you just subtly grab anyone else? It doesn't have to be me. It'd be great. I'd love to pray with you, but just subtly grab someone and let them know, you know, that word that Phil brought, I, I really want to pray into that. Um, and for the rest of us, I'd love it. I'll, I'll pass back over to you now, mate, but um, to Pete, sorry, but I'd love it if we just came before him in worship and spent some time praying afterwards. It's like, okay. And just say, Lord, will you just sow some seeds if I can't in my heart? Yeah? yeah. Amen.